So this is what we'll talk today during this uh, session. So we'll talk about the introduction of nonlinear analysis, the presentation and the procedure uh, and the option in nonlinear analysis, nonlinear geometry, uh, as well elastoplasticity, hyperelasticity, nonlinear contacts, and some conclusion and advice for better use of nonlinear analysis. So it, it makes a lot of things. So uh, this is why I decided to divide this webinar in two, actually. So today I will only present the three first points. Introduction to nonlinear, uh, the, the analysis procedure in NFX, the options, and also nonlinear geometry options. And the other points I will do it next week at the same time. So uh, next week we'll have the rest of this and also more uh, examples. So today uh, I only prepared one, demo, one uh, tutorial to show you how to use a nonlinear. So uh, we'll see that during this session. So let's go on. So first of all, uh, what should be uh, known is that most of the physical phenomenon that we can see every day are nonlinear. So uh, we cannot really neglect this, uh, this kind of phenomenon. So usually why do we do linear is because uh, we just suppose that the nonlinear uh, thing is just too small to, uh, to be really considered and we just consider linear. So I'll, we'll explain what is the difference and what it means, of course. So you can see all these phenomena, for example, in the photo. So this, uh, you see the big deformation here. Uh, here too, it's uh, forming, uh, metal forming, so you have a huge uh, deformation and stress. And as well, the breaking of some uh, equipment, the crash analysis, uh, this is nonlinear contacts. And all that is really nonlinear. So, so here, for example, the first, a uh, type of nonlinearity that we'll talk about is the geometric nonlinearity. So it is explained when an object is subjected to excessive deformation or when the load direction is changing. Uh, the second type of nonlinearity is the material nonlinearity. So when the relation between the stress and the strain is not elastic, so it means that you have kind of elastoplastic relation or maybe another kind of relation to describe the material that uh, you are using. And the third type is the contact nonlinearity. So it is basically when the contact of an object uh, with another is uh, changing. So obviously during a crash you have a kind of general contact between the parts so it is really a nonlinear phenomenon. So what is uh, linear analysis first? Because uh, before understanding the, what is nonlinear, you should remember what is linear. So I think everyone knows what is the Hooke's law, uh, which is kind of uh, linearization of something more complex, which describes the relation between the force and the displacement. So uh, basically, in the linear domain of your material, uh, you can just say that the, um, uh, the K coefficient, so it's the Young's modulus, is constant. And so it's, it has a very big impact because it will just say that when you apply a force of one kilogram to uh, an object, like the one on the, on the left, you'll have a deformation of one millimeter. So if you apply 10 kilograms, you'll have 10 millimeters. So it's perfectly linear. So when k is always constant, f value can be obtained easily. So you can think that if you have only one di dimension, you can simply you know, uh, inverse the matrix you, and you get the results. Uh, so it's quite easy to, to determine the displacement when you have the force. Now, uh, nonlinear is the, the big difference is that, for example, the, the, this k coefficient is not constant. So you will consider a changing relation between the, the force and the displacement. So when the load increases, the stiffness actually changes. 
and the relation between the load and the displacement is a nonlinear function. So in the linear case constant, and displacement can be obtained simply by uh, inversing the k and the load. Uh, but in the other case, you need to know the, the curve of the, sl the slope. So this uh, cannot be determined in one iteration. So this is also a big difference is that linear can be done in one time. So you just inverse the matrix, you get the result. Nonlinear cannot because you have a changing relation. So at each, at several positions, so you, you take several positions on the curve, which call the load steps. And at this position, each time you do again the calculation to get a new result. So these are uh, some examples of nonlinear phenomenon. So uh, for example, uh, you have some impacts in a propeller, for example, some uh, rubber uh, as well, some kind of metal forming, and this is a rubber uh, as well. So today I'll talk about nonlinear static analysis, but uh, you have to know that we have much more than nonlinear static. You have also nonlinear dynamic, also called explicit but it will be the subject of another webinar because it's a very complex subject but very interesting. So for example the two examples here, the one on the left, the turbine impact and the metal forming here, they are both uh, nonlinear dynamic examples because it's happening in a very short time. Now maybe what you are wondering is when should I use nonlinear analysis? Because from now from now maybe you're, you're always doing linear analysis and uh, you would like to know when do I really need nonlinear because uh, you need to know that when you're using nonlinear it uh, implies more difficulty to make the analysis because it's more complex also uh, it implies that you need more time to calculate and everything so you need really to think when should I really use a nonlinear so there are all these points uh, will give you detail. So when you need more accurate data, so especially when you have nonlinear material, it will give you much accurate data. When the position uh, of the contact happens is changing. So if you have a general contact, for example, between two parts, not in contact at the beginning, after entering in contact, then you have a changing position and this is when you need uh, nonlinear as well large deformation is susceptible to happen. So if you have very small deformation then uh, maybe you can use linear but as soon as you have big deformation so you can see it with your eyes this is nonlinear. Then when you have a stress level which approaches the yield points of the material so you have very big uh, stresses and strains so it makes that uh, you have plastic deformation inside your model. As well, if you are doing buckling analysis, so I'll talk about that so right after, uh, to determine the precise buckling load, this is also useful. And if you have usually big displacements, uh, if you are using rubbers, so you need hyperelastic materials, uh, all that you will need nonlinear. So let's go now a bit more in the theory. So. Uh, what is really the difference how, and what is the method used to calculate this nonlinear static analysis. So it's very interesting. Uh, so here you have a very short comparison between linear and nonlinear. So linear, you have the response of the structure which is submitted uh, to a load and can be determined using simple equation F equal KU. So linear. Nonlinear, uh, you cannot because H is actually a nonlinear function. So you, what you have to do is to divide this curve in small load steps and on each load step then you will say on this load step it's small enough. I can say this is, uh, let's say it can be linearized the curve on this part. So you will do a kind of local, uh, local uh, resolution of the matrix and at the end you put all together. So nonlinear needs several iterations, so this is important. 
Now, the basic incremental method uh, that I, I will just describe is the one on the left. So, let's say you have the total force, you decide to divide it into smaller forces, so uh, delta F. So, each of these delta F, you will approximate again the, uh, the curve. So, it means that uh, you'll have something nonlinear. But you have a big problem if you do that, is that you see that at each step you'll have a small error that will be introduced. And at the end, the error will be cumulated. So you'll have a big error at the end. So this is the big problem of the incremental, simple incremental method. So this is why there's have been a lot of improvement on this very simple method. And the first improvement is called the newton raphson method. So if you did some numerical analysis, you know uh, newton raphson So you will, it will introduce a supplementary iteration at each of this load step. So I'm doing the first load step, then I do another iteration in order to get closer to the curve. And I will reduce this error to zero. Well, obviously not exactly zero, but uh, you'll get something better. So this is a description of the newton raphson method. So you see on this curve that, let's say, the, the first load step, this is the first iteration going here. Then you'll have several increments until it converge and it reach the curves. So on each of these increments, you have an error that will be reduced and reduced at each increment. So uh, when can we say that the solution on a load step is converging? It's converging when this error is actually smaller than a certain tolerance that you defined uh, in the software. So this is KT. Uh, delta U displacement equal, and this is the difference uh, which represents this error. So, in uh, this is called the error tolerance. So there's three criteria for the er error tolerance: the load, displacement, and the walk. So if I uh, show you here on this curve, uh, the three criteria. So it's, if you look at the, the, the scheme here, it's quite easy to understand. You can measure, measure the error in three ways. So the first way to measure the error is to measure the difference of displacement between the actual curve and the last iteration that we, you got. So this is, this is called the displacement uh, tolerance criterion. Then you have the load criterion because you can as well uh, measure the error in the load. So this is the load tolerance criterion. And you can as well say that I have a difference of surface, and this is called the walk uh, criterion. So usually uh, when we do nonlinear analysis, we use two convergence criterion together to obtain satisfying results. So you can either use displacement plus walk, or you can use load plus walk. Um, maybe some person are wondering why I cannot use the three together. Well, it will be very difficult to converge, because you have displacement, load, plus walk, so it's, it's not uh, advised to use the three together. And it's not advised either to use only one, because it will reduce the, the accuracy of your solution. So, um, you have these two combinations, let's say, displacement plus work or load plus work. So, usually we use displacement plus work, but in some time you can use also the other one. So, it depends actually if the load, if the curve you have is very sensible to the change in, uh, in the force, for example. So, you can see in this criterion, if you have a curve which looks like that, so a small change in the force will uh, increase, a small change in displacement will increase a lot of the force. Uh, you will have to use the load criteria, 
if you have a curve which is like that, then it's better to use the, the displacement criterion. Now, um, you have even more methods than that. So you have a method called the full Newton Raphson. So in this method, uh, at each uh, load step and at each increment, the stiffness will be calculated again. So it's, let's say, the most accurate of all the methods, but it's also the methods which take the most of the time. Now, you can also use the modified Newton Raphson, which is much faster than the full Newton Raphson. Why? Because it only updates the stiffness at each load step, but not at each um, increment, for example. So at increment, it doesn't uh, update the stiffness, but it's only uh, doing some iteration in order to get the convergence. And you have the initial uh, stiffness method, which keeps the value of the initial stiffness. Uh, the result is that you will have more increments, but it's also faster than the full newton raphson So in NFX, usually uh, the method to use is chosen automatically, but you can as well choose which method you want to use. So if in a per particular case you would like to try the full newton raphson instead of using the modified newton raphson then uh, you can do that in the option. So I'll show you uh, after how uh, and where you can define that. Now uh, let's talk a bit, a bit about the buckling because it's also interesting to know uh, why we need the nonlinear to perform the buckling analysis. Um, first of all, what is the buckling? So buckling is when you have a structure which uh, have a stable equilibrium state, so like for example this one, it's a beam, so uh, you apply an actual load on, uh, on the top, and what you are actually waiting for is that you will have a compression of the beam in the same direction that the load. So this is a theoretical, you know, a theoretical result that you will get if you calculate that uh, with formulas, let's say. But what happens in reality? It happens that the beam goes on the right or on, in the left. So this is called the buckling. So this is actually due to an instability of uh, the, the material because of the thickness of this. So it's due to the geometry. So you can think about anything, a ruler, uh, maybe a uh, notebook. So I have a notebook here. You can think the thickness is here. So if I apply a load, I'm waiting that it compress. But if I do that, you see it buckle. So this is the buckling. Now, uh, why should we use uh, nonlinear thickness, uh, nonlinear analysis to do buckling? Because you have two states of the buckling you have first the stable equilibrium state. So it means uh, that you apply the buckling load on it, but until a certain uh, value of the load, you don't see any buckling. So the, the system is stable. But when this load that you apply is bigger than the buckling load, then you have the buckling who appears. So what we, when we do a buckling uh, analysis, usually what we want to know is when and what is the value of this buckling load. So uh, the big difference between linear buckling and nonlinear buckling is that for linear buckling the it can be dangerous to use uh, linear buckling because the buckling load is actually overestimated. So if you look at this uh, scheme, so this is the real curve, but you see the linear buckling uh, curve is like that. So it's the buckling load will be estimated like uh, the point here, whereas it actually is here. So you have a very big overestimation of uh, this, so this is dangerous. Uh, then, uh, of course, it's, you have some limitation due to the linear type of analysis. For example, you cannot use uh, elastic, uh, plasto, elastoplastic material, for example or nonlinear behavior cannot be considered. So the advantage of the nonlinear buckling is that you can see the real nonlinear buckling behavior. So you can see two things. The first thing is 
before the buckling really appears and after the buckling. So this is the advantage of the nonlinear buckling analysis. Calculate the real buckling load and uh, consider nonlinear material behavior as well. Now there's another problem that appears. If you look at this uh, picture here, is that when uh, this nonlinear buckling, when you have the convergence, let's say the iteration uh, of your load, and at a certain point it goes through the, the buckling point. So at this point it cannot converge because the, the, the tangential stiffness is either zero or it's ne negative. So you see here that the error will become very big in this place. So the solver will just say, oh, you have a very big error. It's not converging. So how you can do that? Actually, there's a method which is uh, special to do such kind of analysis. And it's called the arc length method. Uh, or you have another method, which is the displacement control. So uh, I'll tell about the arc length method. So it's a method which actually uses a different way to calculate the error. Uh, you can see this graph. So actually it's using an angle. So this is why it's called the arc length method. You have the update of the stiffness. This is the first load increment. And here it will calculate the error between uh, the, the point here and the curve following the arc. So not like the usual way to calculate the error tolerance. So this is so you see that when you happen in this state, it will work much better because in this state the error will decrease again. So using this method, it's possible to uh, to do the analysis. So uh, Midas and FX provides this uh, arc length method, and as well you have several types of method which can be used for this. So you have the Chris field, the Riggs, and the modified Riggs methods which are all useful for such arc length method. Okay, now um, let's talk quickly about the parameters. So, um, so I'll show you where in the software it is because maybe you don't see where is this uh, picture. So I open quickly the software. Don't worry, I will show you an example at the end uh, of nonlinear, but right now I'm still talking about the theory. So let's say I create a nonlinear case and you have the analysis case for this. So here in the analysis control you will get all the option uh, for this case. So uh, actually you have to click on the subcase here and then click on subcase control, sorry. So in the subcase control you'll find the option to control the nonlinear analysis. So the first one is the nonlinear geometry option. So I'll talk about that. You have to activate it to consider the large deformation. You have the, the number of uh, increments, so number of load step actually you will consider. Then you have the different types of uh, convergence criteria that I talked about. So displacement, load and work. So here you can choose uh, which are the two kinds of uh, tolerance that you want to use. And here you have the advanced nonlinear parameter. If you click here on advanced, so by default, it's just checked, use the default settings. But if you uncheck that, you'll be able to choose uh, what method you want to use. So you see you'll have the full newton raphson the initial stiffness, the modified newton raphson all, all this method will be here. Uh, Analysis option for the, the kind of the, the B section, I'll talk about that a bit later. And here you have the arc lens. So if you check this, and you click on arc lens parameters, then you can add more, you have more parameters to uh, play on this arc lens method. So you have these three methods that I talked about, the cruise field, the rigs, and the modified rigs, and the parameters that are going with. So I'll not really detail all of them. So, um, so this is the what I've shown to you. So you have to, to go in this window and to set the parameters. So today uh, I will not really detail each and every option because there's a lot of things to uh, to present. 
Okay, the, now the second method when you have nonlinear buckling is to use a displacement control method. Uh, rather than just applying a load, you can impose a displacement to your model. And in this case, uh, the, it's, it will be more easy to determine the, to, to make the convergence. So after that, how uh, you can determine this buckling load by looking at the constraints. So if you apply the displacement, you can get the buckling load by looking at the constraint force. Okay, now let's present a bit the procedure and the option in nonlinear analysis. So how we'll define all these options in NFX. So first of all, uh, let's compare the linear analysis procedure and the nonlinear analysis procedure. So uh, it's a bit, the two procedures are a bit similar. So there's no big changes, but at some points, you need to, to change a bit and to assign some nonlinear properties. So the, the basic process for all uh, FE analysis in NFX is the following. So first, define the geometric model, assign the materials, assign the element properties, prepare the meshing, then assign the boundary condition, insert the loading condition, then uh, create the analysis case and perform the analysis, and then verify the results. Now, if you go in nonlinear, so uh, material assignment then will be nonlinear material assignment. So it's the same except that you have to input the nonlinear properties. Uh, assignment of the boundary condition, here you have nonlinear contact assignment. And uh, create the analysis case and perform the analysis. So in this case, you'll have to define the nonlinear options and activate the geometry uh, analysis. And then uh, you have the different analysis options that uh, you need to know to perform the nonlinear analysis. So uh, I'll talk about that right after. So first, what is the method to create this uh, nonlinear analysis? Uh, it's actually simple and uh, similar to uh, linear. So you create your analysis case like you would do for uh, any type of analysis. And then in the solution type, you choose nonlinear static. Then, as I did, you, you go into the subcase control, you click on it, and here uh, you check it to consider the geometric nonlinearity. So this is the first thing to do. So um, when should you check this option? Well, when it is obvious that you will have large deformation, then you need to check it. If you don't know if you will get large deformation or not, you can check it first, and if at the end you don't get a uh, large deformation on your model, then you can run again the analysis and uncheck this option. Uh, a big difference is that it will be much faster if you don't check this option, because uh, geometric nonlinearity takes a lot of time to calculate. So uh, if you don't check it, it will be much faster. But uh, of course, if you have large displacement, you need to check it. So sometimes you do your nonlinear analysis and the result you see, oh, it's strange. Why my displacement is so strange? It looks not real or something like that. Well, most of the time it's because you forgot to check this option. So uh, uh, don't forget to check it. Now um, you have the convergence criterion. So uh, you have to select two convergence criterion, usually load plus work. Uh, is used, or you can use displacement plus uh, work as well in some cases. So uh, don't use three convergence criteria because it's quite difficult to converge, and don't use only one because the convergence is easy, but it will be difficult to obtain, uh, let's say, exact uh, results. Now you have the intermediate output request. So uh, it means that uh, you can actually choose uh, what do you want to see in the output of your result. Do you want to only see the final result of the analysis, the last step, 
or do you want to see the result at, at each load step? Or maybe do you want to see the result at each increment of each load step? So if you, depending on what you want to see, you'll have to check uh, that. So usually you just check uh, every increment or maybe every non-bisecting increment. So uh, talking about bisection, uh, bisection is quite useful. Uh, it uh, is automatically done when you don't have the convergence on one load step. So let's say you don't have the convergence on this load step. So the load step will be automatically divided by two and then the analysis will be done again. So the software will try to, uh, to again and again to see if maybe the convergence, you don't have convergence because your uh, load step is too big. So it happens a lot, maybe your increments is not high enough. So in this case, you'll have the bisection. Okay, uh, so uh, I will not describe in detail these advanced nonlinear parameters. So uh, I just talk, you can choose here the method you want to use. You can use a custom uh, update method for the stiffness, so either semi-automatic, automatic, or uh, each iteration. Uh, option to terminate the analysis. So if you have, you can choose to terminate the analysis on a failed convergence. Uh, so not apply the bisection, so this is what it means. And here uh, you have maximum of bisection of 50. So sometimes it's a bit too large, so you can change that. Uh, you can also enable line search. Now uh, let's talk about the subcases. So it's interesting to talk about that because uh, it's different from the subcases in linear uh, analysis. So usually subcases are to investigate several combination of loads uh, in linear analysis, but in nonlinear it works differently. So uh, if you look at this picture, so you see that you have, uh, let's say, a movement of some object, and you want to decompose this movement in three steps. So you have the step which is Going up here, you have the second step here where you have, let's say, some plasticity maybe, and you have the third step here when you have, uh, I don't know, the, the breaking or something, and you want to analyze one after another. So this is when you use the subcases. So during the first subcase, you'll apply first the load one. During the second subcase, you'll apply the load two in addition to the load one. And in the third subcase, you will take off these two loads, and then you'll see uh, the you'll see the, the displacement coming back to the initial position if it's elastic or maybe to the plastic state. So we will see that during the the tutorial. So this a simple example of what we can do is, for example, you have an object that is moving, so going down for the first step and second step going in this direction. So uh, this represents the first subcase and the second subcase. Same for this kind of object. So we'll do a simulation with this second case. So a spring which is going down and then going up. Uh, let's talk briefly about the restart feature. It's an interesting feature when you have um, because the thing is that nonlinear analysis takes quite a long time to calculate, usually, and so you don't want to uh, begin from the beginning each time you try again. So let's say you do your nonlinear analysis, but it doesn't converge from, let's say, the, uh, the middle of analysis, so 50%. So you don't want to do, again, this 51st percent because it takes two hours maybe, so what you can define is restart condition. So what you have to do is define several subcases, like I talked, and you can restart from the solution of the previous subcase. So it means that if you do subcase 1, 2, 3, 4, during the subcase 3, the convergence uh, is not, uh, you don't get convergence then you can restart from the end of the subcase 2. So 
you have to specify uh, the generation restart info file uh, here and yes you have to you have to check this option generation restart info file if this is not checked uh, the software will not save the result from each of the subcase so uh, it will be quite uh, so you will not be able to do the restart so you need to check that when you when you want to consider the restart and then when you actually want to do the restart you can check the second option and uh, find the the path of the the result file uh, there's a second thing that you need to know and that uh, usually a lot of people don't know is that you can get the result of the analysis, uh, the non analysis during the analysis. So you don't need to wait until the end of the analysis to get the results. Uh, I'll show you that when I will do uh, my uh, tutorial in a few minutes. Then uh, you have different types of results which are special for nonlinear, like the equivalent stress, the plastic uh, plastic kind of, this is equivalent stress and then you have let's say effective plastic uh, strain so if you want to see that don't forget to add this result so to add a new type of result you have to right click in the analysis case choose insert analysis result and then you choose solid stress effective plastic and then you check that and you will be able to see the plastic strain Okay, um, before going to the last point, we'll uh, do something uh, concrete. So I will go into my lesson effects and uh, we will do some nonlinear simulation to uh, show you the process and how uh, to perform this kind of analysis with NFX. So uh, this is analyst mode. So I'll go into the analyst mode. You can do as well in the designer mode. So first thing I'll do is to import my uh, CAD model. So um, this is the leaf spring. Okay. So it's a very simple model. It's a model composed of a plate and a spring. So what I want to do is to analyze the um, when the spring is going down against the plate, then uh, the formation of the spring, which will have a nonlinear material assigned, and then spring is going up again, and I will uh, look at this uh, plastic deformation. So the, actually there is a gap between the plate and the spring at the beginning, so you see they are not touching one another, so there's also, uh, there's also general contacts between the two. So I always take this example because it's very uh, it shows you the three types of nonlinearity. It shows you the nonlinear contacts, the nonlinear material, and the large deformation as well. So the first thing I have to do is to define some uh, material. So uh, I'll go into the mesh tab, click on material. Uh, I will add a new isotropic material and let's create the elastoplastic material so it will be a material of the spring so I call it spring then uh, let's give you the elastic model so let me check what is the value okay 236 339.3 and for the Poisson's ratio is 0.266 I will not consider the gravity, so I don't need to input the mass density. And now you need to define the stress-strain curve, which is very important uh, to define the nonlinearity. So go into the function here, click on stress-strain function, and here I will input my data. So what I'll do is simply going into Excel, and I already have the data for uh, this example, so I simply copy all that then I go into NFX again and I paste this data to get my uh, nonlinear curve so when I did that I click on OK 
and don't forget to assign a curve to uh, this because uh, it is important. So um, you see that in this tab you have more, uh, you have different types of uh, criterion actually that you can define here. Plastic hardening, stress strain curve, or perfect plastic. So these are three types of uh, nonlinear behavior that uh, you can define. So you can define this uh, in these three ways. You can use uh, the creep if you have that in your model. And the last option here is a new one that have been added in 2014 is the element deletion criteria for explicit. So you don't need to consider that right now. So I click on apply and you see my spring material has been assigned. And now uh, let's create a rigid material for the plate. So uh, for the modulus, let's say I will consider 2.5 power 5 and take the same Poisson's ratio and click on OK. So this will be linear material. OK, now I define the three materials. Uh, now I'll need to create the properties that will go with this material. So click property, 3D property, solid, uh, spring. So this will be the spring property, apply, and the rigid property. So I can call it plate because it will be assigned to the plate. Okay, now uh, let's apply the, um, uh, let's say the boundary condition to this model. So the first thing is to apply the contacts between the two parts. So I'll go into static heat analysis tab and I will create a manual contact because uh, the two parts are not in contact at the beginning so I need to tell the software which part will become in contact. So it will be general type of contact. Uh, I choose the master plane here and I will choose the slave surface like that, so one here uh, and the other one on the other side. Okay. And now let's create a contact parameter. So it will be a friction. So uh, here you have all the parameters for the contact, so it's very important to uh, know uh, what are these parameters. But here I'll just change the friction coefficient. So, uh, so we will talk about the, the contacts more in details during next week's session. So uh, next week's session I will explain uh, what are doing all these parameters. So I hope you will be there to see that. Now let's assign this friction and click on OK. So I can check in the walk tree that this contact has been assigned correctly. So if I click here you see on the screen you'll see the slave faces in blue and the master uh, surface in red. Okay. Next step is to um, make the boundary condition, so to uh, to actually constrain this model. So let's click on constrain. I will constrain some faces. So uh, let's constrain the plate. So I select this edge and the other edge here, and. Okay, will, okay, it's better like that. Okay, and I will fix it. Apply. So I fix these two uh, boundaries. Now uh, my spring will go only in uh, one direction, which is the Z direction. So I can fix uh, X and Y direction of the spring. Otherwise, uh, you'll have some uh, degree of freedom which uh, will be allowed and uh, FEA software doesn't uh, like the supplementary DOF. So I check TX and TY. I click on OK. And now I got my boundary condition. Next things to assign is the load. So uh, in this case the load is a displacement. So uh, I go into displacement. 
I select this face, so uh, this I will apply the displacement to this face in Z direction and it will be a displacement of minus 8 millimeter. So uh, I will create two displacement sets because I will use a subcase like I talked during uh, this uh, PPT. So this will be the, the 8 millimeter translation. So during the first subcase I will do that. Apply. Now I click again on this plate and uh, it, I will input 0 so it will come back to 0 and this will be initial position. So what it will do is actually it will go down to uh, minus 8 millimeter and in the second subcase it will go up again to the, the position, initial position. So if I want to check that I got all my boundary condition I can go in the walk tree here and you have the constraints, so the two constraints, the 8 millimeter translation and the translational the initial position. Okay, so I think I'm ready to mesh all that. So let's go into the meshing 3D. And what I will do is I will uncheck the high order elements uh, in order to go a bit faster because it's a simple demonstration. Of course in a real model it's better to have high order element because it will be more accurate. So let's check that this is the plate. Okay, let's check the size. It looks okay. So I can call the mesh set plate, for example. Apply. Let's wait a few seconds. Okay, I got my mesh. Now let's mesh the spring. So I have to choose the second property, the spring property. And same, I'll call it spring. I check the size, looks OK. And I click on OK. OK, now I got uh, this. And I am ready to uh, do the most difficult part, let's say, which is the definition of the nonlinear options. So let's go into, so you can directly right click on the analysis case and choose nonlinear static, it will be faster. And edit. And in this case, so uh, here I have one subcase, so I'll create a second one. So I click create, nonlinear static, uh, give it a name of uh, back initial position and the first subcase so you have to click on F2 to change the name um, 8 millimeter translation I click on this button to assign all the loads to the two and then I will drag and draw uh, the initial position loads here and 8 millimeter here so you see in the first subcase you have uh, what do you have you have the boundary condition, you have the 8 millimeter translation, and you have the contact. In the second subcase, you have the boundary condition, your initial position load, and the manual contact as well. Now uh, let's click on each subcase and define the subcase control options. So don't forget to check the geometry nonlinear because here obviously I'll have some uh, geometry nonlinear things. Uh, I will use load plus walk uh, criteria. Here I will not touch this advanced nonlinear parameter because the normal parameter will be OK. OK. And click on OK. So you have only one thing to check. Second subcase check also the geometry nonlinear, 20 increments, so sometimes you need to increase the number of increments, uh, you, if you have a very a big model of very nonlinear model, you need may, maybe sometimes 100 uh, increments are uh, possible. Okay, now uh, let's go in the analysis option and see if I need to change something, so here are uh, contacts, okay, so uh, why 
some people are wondering why I have also a contact option here. Uh, I can define a contact already uh, before in the prepost. So there's two types of contact definition. The contact I defined is uh, defined in the prepost, and this type of contact is defined in the solver. So sometimes it's faster maybe to define directly in the solver, so you can use contact here instead of define it before. Now you have different types of parameters. So these parameters are important as well. So for example, you have uh, contact parameters. So for 2D element thickness in contact, both known or master. So it is when you have two plates, for example, two plate elements which are in contact. Um, and you want to consider the thickness of the plates. So actually it's very important to understand that if at the beginning the two plates are really touching one another, then you should choose none. Otherwise you'll have very big stress in the plates. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, go on. And this you have the restart option that I was talking about uh, for the restart of the model. And they have the initial condition. So if you have initial force or initial stress in your model, uh, you have to check this option as well. Okay, let's click on OK and let's save the model. Okay, uh, call it number two. And now uh, let's run the simulation. So I hope it will be okay because my uh, PC is a bit slow. So it usually takes 200 seconds, so uh, two minutes. So we'll just wait a few seconds. So uh, you can see here first that you have uh, the nonlinear graph, which is um, which is belonging to your model. So you will see each increment on this graph. And here on the window here, uh, you will have a view of the iteration. So uh, you have the different load step, which is called increment. So the increment correspond to what I call the load step. Then you have the iteration. Okay, it's talk my computer is overloaded. Uh, I will just stop to share the webcam for one uh, moment because uh, it's a bit as I was telling you, my computer is a bit slow. Now you see that you have the iteration, so this is what I was talking about when I was talking about the uh, newton raphson method. So you see that is, at this increment the iteration are uh, quite a lot because it doesn't uh, converge. So what it will do is that it will do a bisection here. So uh, you see, converges not likely B section load increment. So it divides this increment in two. So it comes back to 22.5%. And then it try again to do the iteration until it will converge. So it will do that maximum five times. And if it doesn't uh, converge after five B section, then uh, it will diverge. But usually, uh, when it doesn't converge after five B sections, it means that you have a problem in your model. So uh, you need to change the model. It's not because of uh, uh, the solver can't find a solution or something like that. So you see here, uh, now it's converging. You have 40%. And uh, now we are still doing the analysis. But what I want to show you is that you can actually already see the result in your model. So uh, before the end of the solution. So you don't need to wait until the end. So for that you right click in the analysis case, you click on open the result file. So uh, okay, and here you will find the the result file that uh, has been generated. I click on open it. Now you see that it's still computing, but you have access to the first results which are already computed. So it's quite uh, useful to see if you did something uh, wrong or maybe if your model 
looks correct. Otherwise, if it doesn't look correct at the first increment, that you can stop and then you can try to uh, modify the model. So here you see that my spring is going down and then it is deforming against the plate and it stopped here because my analysis is still at this state. So it's very useful to have this uh, because you don't need to wait. You can see uh, before the end what will be the results. So this is uh, this is the form is a stress, uh, stress strains equivalent uh, results. Also for, for those who are already uh, minus NFX users, uh, I can tell you that in the new uh, release of 2014, the solver has been improved again, so uh, it is even more faster to, to converge the non-limit analysis in this new uh, version. So the developers really did a good job and uh, it's much faster than uh, what we had. Okay, um, maybe I will just stop and I will uh, open uh, another model because I don't want to wait for a few minutes more. I know you are all uh, very busy, so I don't want to disturb your work too too much. And uh, at the same time, I thank uh, all the engineers who joined today's webinar. We have uh, 20 people today, so it's it's good. And I hope uh, that it's interesting. Um, you can, if you have some question, uh, don't hesitate to ask during the webinar. So, uh, okay, so this is the result from uh, this. So if I uh, drag this, I'll see the spring going down. So this is the first thing, first subcase, and then the second subcase, it's going back to the initial position. So the interesting thing is that you see the plastic deformation, uh, which is actually occurring in this uh, model. So you can you can actually, uh, so this is, this is, uh, let me see, the stress equivalent, uh, equivalent stress. Now let's say I want to see the plastic strain, so I right click here and insert analysis result. Now I'm going to solid, let's say strain, uh, strain effective plastic, okay, I want to see that. And okay, now you have a view of the uh, maximum plastic strain uh, that are remaining in the spring after the analysis. Okay, I have a question: uh, Why the form is stressed are not symmetric? Well, uh, this is a very good question, and actually, it's uh, because my mesh is not good enough. So it's what I was talking about. Uh, this is only demonstration to show you the process, but if I really want to get good results on this model, I should use much smaller uh, mesh on this model, because uh, in this case I have only one layer of mesh uh, in the thickness, which is very bad actually. If I want to get the real uh, stress on this model, I should consider at least uh, two range or three range of uh, mesh. So this is why I get some uh, result which seems a bit strange or not symmetric. That's uh, basically because uh, you need to refine a bit the model. But what you need to know also when you are doing uh, nonlinear an analysis, it's always better to try first with a simple model and they then try to refine the mesh to make it better. Because if you try from the beginning with a very complex model, you'll have a lot of difficulty to to make it converge because from the beginning, you have a lot of mesh, it takes a lot of time and resources, so uh, better to try first with a simple model and then you can improve it to make it better. Do, do you have more questions on this model maybe, or maybe the process or the options or something like that? Okay, no question until now. 
So I think we'll go back quickly to the PBT. So I have a short uh, last few slides, so let's say three slides for today. So uh, geometric nonlinearity. So I'll talk briefly about that. So first of all, uh, what is the geometric nonlinearity? Well, it's a kind of linearity which appears because you have a large displacement. So um, when you have large displacement or large rotation in the structure, then you will have large strength as well. And uh, if you don't consider geometric nonlinearity, you'll have some uh, strange phenomenon. For example, uh, in a linear uh, type of analysis, you see you have this beam. This is uh, this lens. If you don't consider the geometric nonlinearity, but you apply the moment here, you see you will have something like that. So it means you uh, the lens, the full lens of the the column will actually increase compared to uh, what you should have. So if you really go into nonlinear and you consider this geometric nonlinear, you will have this. So it's very different, the two. So this is because of this geometric nonlinearity option. So uh, considering this option actually uh, adds um, the, the large displacement uh, factor in the in the Hooke's uh, equations, maybe you under, you remember how uh, you can linearize the Hooke's equation in order to get some uh, linear relation. So in this process, there's a term in the equation which is composed of um, second order derivatives. So this term is actually uh, this geometric nonlinearity. So if you uh, consider this option, it means you don't neglect this term. So uh, large displacement, large rotation. So here only one thing to say is that you can have large displacement and large rotation without having large strain. So it can happen that you have a rotation of the model or something, and it actually doesn't create large strain, but uh, you have large displacement. Then uh, large strain. So uh, another thing to remember about the large strain is that there's a big deformation. The, this is basically what means the large strain. So in this case, um, the mesh is deformed a lot. So um, what what you should do in this case is that you should remember that if the mesh is deformed too much at the end of the analysis then uh, it will either diverge or you will not get accurate results. So in order to, um, to, uh, to, to, to get correct answer and to get correct modeling of the model, what you should do is actually from the beginning consider shorter mesh by considering that it will extend when you apply the force. So uh, in this case, it will be okay at the end. So you should consider the quality of the mesh. That will happen at the end of the analysis. So it's very tricky, but if you do that, you're sure to get a correct modeling. So it's uh, particularly uh, in the cases of metal forming. So in this case, you need to consider such kind of thing because you have obviously large deformation. Uh, and also, N geometric nonlinearity also happens in one other case. It's when you have uh, some nonlinear type of force, uh, like the follower force. So the follower force is a specific type of load that um, the direction of this load is actually changing during the analysis. So um, a basic load that the direction is not changing, so it will do something like that. but follower force will actually follow the deformation to uh, to give you something like that. So in this case, it is also some kind of geometric nonlinearity. So uh, in NFX, we have this follower force, uh, which can be defined like that. So uh, you define the first node, which will be the starting position, and the second node, which will be the end. 
And during the analysis, the load will always follow the direction of these two nodes. Okay, so this is um, some advice when you have a geometric nonlinearity. So when the mesh deformation is too large, some error can happen. So uh, this is why it is better to think about the mesh size according to the deformation. So this is what I was telling you. Uh, then it's more easy. Uh, analysis convergence is more easy for one order element uh, rather than two second order. So this is also something to know. And uh, if the solution of the nonlinear has the probability to converge with some oscillation, then uh, you should use the line search method to help uh, to get the convergence. So it's also a very specific case. Uh, it's uh, you don't have frequently this kind of thing, but sometimes, who knows? Okay, now uh, it's over for today's webinar because uh, we'll talk about the all the slides during next week's session. Uh, there's a lot of things to say uh, about nonlinear and uh, I cannot teach you everything during only one session because uh, it's a very big subject. So during next session we'll talk about the elastoplasticity, so the material nonlinearity, uh, the hyperelasticity, so the rubber materials. We'll talk about the general contact things, so how you define a contact and how uh, you represent all the options for the contract. And uh, also I'll give some advice to make a successful nonlinear static analysis uh, with my design effects. Okay, now it's time for the questions. So uh, we'll have a few minutes to answer your questions uh, in, in live. So if you have some questions, please uh, ask, ask me right now in the chat section. So is there some question? Or maybe you are all sleeping. I hope not. <laughs> what was it at least uh, useful to to have such uh, reminder about the theory because I'm always speaking, speaking, but I would like to hear also what you think and it's uh, it's good to have some feedback sometime uh, to know if I'm not talking for uh, no one. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, is it possible to have, uh, to get from you this presentation? Yes, of course it's possible. Uh, I will send it to you so uh, you can take a look and uh, maybe give me some feedback. Uh, does, is it possible to phase analysis plus material and geometric analysis on the same time? Uh, yes, of course. And actually it's what I did during uh, today's uh, tutorial. You saw that I have large deformation, I used nonlinear material, and I used contacts, nonlinear contact at the same time. So you can uh, obviously use uh, the three types of nonlinearity in the same model. So, more questions? So I will also uh, send you the video of this uh, session because it has been recorded. So uh, you can always uh, look back and uh, uh, if you are not uh, trying Midas NFX right now or if you are not Midas NFX user, uh, you can always request a trial. So we have 30 days trial which is free uh, and available. So you can either request it on Midas NFX website or you can ask me, so uh, Cyprian Midas it.com so if you send me your uh, request or any question you have uh, we will be here to take a look and uh, answer and maybe give you the trial or give you some material we have 
Okay, then if I don't have any more questions, uh, I hope, I think it will be the end of today's session and uh, I hope you will be present for next week's uh, session as well to continue uh, this uh, training about nonlinear analysis, which is a very interesting topic. In the future, we'll have also some webinar about uh, explicit uh, analysis, about dynamic analysis, about CFD, so there's a lot of things to, uh, to learn about. Okay, then uh, goodbye and have a nice day.